Hello, my name is Dr. Stephen Bradburn from toptipbio.com and in this video tutorial I'm going to show you how to use GraphPad Prism to create a heat map and to understand how to interpret the output. So what are heat maps? Heat maps are a standard way to plot grouped data. An example can be shown on screen. The basic idea of a heat map is that the graph is divided into rectangles or squares, each representing one cell on the data table, one row and one data set. The rectangle or square is color coded according to the value of that cell in the table. So when would you use a heat map? Heat maps are great to plot large amounts of data containing different groups such as gene expression data from microarrays or protein concentrations from proteomic analyses. In this tutorial, I will show you how to specifically create and interpret this heat map of gene expression values from different tissues and samples. So let's now go into PRISM and begin the tutorial. In the setup, I'm going to select grouped on the left hand window. and we're going to start with sample data to follow a tutorial. And in this instance, I'm going to select heat map under special uses of group tables. And then I'm going to click the create button. So I'm just going to minimize the note. So let's have a look at this data in more detail. This data is from a gene expression experiment involving six different tissues or samples and six different genes. So the different genes are shown as different columns, genes one to six, and the different samples or tissues in this instance are indicated by the different rows. Each number represents the normalized gene expression value for that sample. And each value in this table will be presented as a single square or rectangle on the heat map. In this particular example, the data set does not contain subcolumns. However, you can have subcolumns or replicate values if you so wish. To create the heat map, I'm going to click on the graph in the left hand window, which is linked to this data table and this is going to open up the graph wizard. Under the graph family, you want to select grouped and then in the tabs option, you want to select heat map. You'll notice there are four standard types of heat maps to choose from in PRISM. Each vary in their color schemes. So we have the rainbow heat map, the grayscale heat map, the blue scale heat map, and the double gradient heat map. For gene expression heat maps, the double gradient heat map is usually the preferred option. If you have subcolumns in your data table, then the plot drop down indicated here will be available. And there is an option to plot the mean, median, geometric mean, standard deviation, standard error of the mean, or the coefficient of variation percentage from your replicates. And for now, I'm going to click the OK button to take us to the graph. So let's explore this heat map in more detail. The heat map itself is displayed on the left with the gradient key on the right. So the gradient key can be seen here. In this example in particular, each row of the heat map represents a different sample or tissue, and each column represents the different gene. The color of each cell corresponds to the data in the data table we've seen previously. In other words, these are the normalized gene expression values. So by looking at the gradient key, this will tell you which color corresponds to the data value. In this instance, green at the bottom of the scale represents the lowest gene expression value. As opposed to the opposite end of the scale, there is red, which indicates the highest gene expression value. Black cells are values which are in the middle of the two extremes. So the amount of color shading is reflected on the data value. By scrolling over each cell in the heat map, you can see the actual value. For example, this one here, the actual value is 114. And if you scroll over the gradient key on the right, you can see what each different shade of color represents. So for example, this shade of black represents a value of 92. At the minute, you'll notice the column and row labels are simply letters and numbers, which is not that informative to the reader. It would be more helpful if these are labeled by their corresponding tissue type on the rows and the gene names on the columns. So to change the appearance of the heat map, you can either click on the format graph button or double click on the graph itself. So the format graph window is now opened and let's go into this in a bit more detail to change the appearance of our heat map. With the color mapping tab selected, the first option is mapping replicates. 
So as I mentioned, if you have entered replicate values side by side, you can choose here what you want the heat map to be based on. Is it the mean, the median, or the geometric mean? You can even choose to make a heat map of variation and base the heat map on the standard deviation, the percentage coefficient of variation, or the standard error of the mean of replicate values. The color map drop down is simply where you can change the color style of the heat map itself. There are six choices here that you can select from. Single gradient is similar to the double gradient, but it only has a single color. Double gradient, which we've selected in this example, lets you choose the baseline value and two extreme colors. Grayscale is the same as a single gradient, however the smallest and largest values are represented as either black or white. For categorical, here you can enter a value or a range of values and you can select what color you want it to show us. So for example, if I click this, you can then enter your value or range here and specify which color you want this to be. A note here that ranges kind of overlap, so you can't have one range which goes from one to two and another two to three, because that would leave it ambiguous how to encode two. So in this instance, you could do a range from one to 1.99 and another from two to 2.99. Another option is rainbow. So rainbow is where you can choose the range of data values. Prism usually chooses the range of colors by fixing the saturation and brightness to 100% and varying the hue from zero degrees to 300 degrees. So when you use the rainbow color map, the largest values are shown in red. So for example, if I click the apply button to preview this, notice how the colors are now in a rainbow style as opposed to a double gradient. Alternatively, you can also change the color map to be a reverse rainbow. And this is where the smallest values will be encoded as red, as seen here. So in this example, I'm going to select the double gradient color map. Underneath, you'll see the range. So this is where you can change the colors of each of the ranges. And for a double gradient, you can change the color of the largest value, which is currently set to red, the baseline value, which is the middle value set to black, and the smallest value, which is currently set to green. These are all selected as auto at the minute, but you can select the custom button here and you can change this value if you so wish. I recommend leaving everything as auto. Another important aspect that you can change in a heat map is what's known as off the map. So here you can choose a color to use if the value is too large or too small to be part of the map you defined, or if the value is blank or excluded. Of course, these choices are irrelevant if no values are off the scale, blank or excluded. So for example, if I change the largest value to be a gene expression value of 100, I can then specify a color for those that are outside the defined range. So let's select yellow. And if I click the apply button, notice now that any cells which have a gene expression value which are above 100 are now colored as yellow. So I'm just going to change my largest value back to being auto, click apply. You can do a similar thing for those values that are blank or excluded values. So in the data table, if there are any blank values or any excluded values, you can choose a color to define these. Additionally, you can choose the option here to place an X through these cells. So if I show you a quick example, if I return to the graph and then go to the data table, if I click on a cell and I want to exclude it, I want to right click and click exclude values. Go back to my graph. Notice now that an X has been placed through this particular cell. So I'm just going back to the data table and I'll re-include this value. And let's go back to the format graph settings. In the next tab, this is graph settings. So here you can change the appearance of the borders and the background of the graph itself. Specifically, the color and thickness of the borders around each cell or box and around the entire heat map. So you can choose to have each cell have its own border by doing this option here. And you can also change the thickness of this. So for example, I make this a bit thicker. Notice now that each cell has its own border, which is slightly thick. Usually in heat maps, cell borders are not shown. You can also change the appearance of the border which surrounds the heat map itself by using this option here. You can also change the shape and size of the heat map. So if you want, you can choose the first option where you specify the size of each cell and you can choose to have these values larger if you want to have larger cells or using the standard setting of setting the size of the heat map which is determined automatically by PRISM, you can choose the overall size of the heat map and change these values here. 
So if, for example, if I change this from 7.62 to 9, click apply, notice how the map itself has changed to be larger. If you want, instead of having square cells, you can use the drop down and you can change these from either wide, square, narrow, or custom. At the bottom, under order, you can optionally reverse the order of the columns and rows, or transpose rows and columns. So for example, if you wanted to reverse the order of your columns, you can tick this option and click apply. Notice now how the graph has shifted to reverse the order of the columns. So F is now on the left and A is on the right. You can do the same for the rows. And if you transpose rows and columns, you can choose to have the columns now as rows and the rows as columns. In the next tab, you can choose to show the graph title as well as the row and column labels. And in the tab after, known as labels, here the first option is cell values. So you can select to have the values shown within each cell of the heat map. A useful feature here is that Prism will color the labels so that they contrast well and are easy to read. For example, if I tick the option and click apply, if you notice now on the actual graph, each cell now contains a value, and this value is, corresponds to the gene expression value in the data table. But notice that those that are darkly colored cells, for example, these black ones here, the font of these values is contrasted so that they're white. However, in lightly colored cells, for example, this green one here, notice that these values have a font which is dark. And this is to allow a contrast so the reader can easily read the values. Usually in the case of gene expression heat maps, cell labeling is not applied since the color of the cell depicts the value, thus making it easy to visualize the result when there are thousands of cells. So it may be useful to use labeling if the heat map was relatively small. An additional example of where you could use labeling is when creating a correlation matrix from a correlation analysis of multiple variables where you want to depict the correlation coefficients. In this instance though, I'm going to choose to remove the labels within each cell. So underneath in row labels, you can choose to change the position of the label itself and what the label actually is. So at the minute you'll notice that the rows are indicated as one, two, three, four, etc. So let's change this option to row titles. Click the apply button. So notice now that each of the row labels corresponds to the tissue type that was in the data table. So this is more informative than just being numbers. There is also the option to change where the marks appear. At the minute it's set to automatically. So usually this is best to let Prism decide on these automatically. However, you can choose to specify every other row if you so wish. And you can also change the appearance of the ticks. So the ticks are these little lines which protrude out of the heat map. You can do this similar thing for column labels, so you can change the position and what the label is. So again, at the minute, the labels are just letters. So let's change this to be the column titles and click apply. So notice now they are gene 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Obviously, in your data set, if you actually had a gene name, you could put this in. And a useful tip is that if the column titles that you specify are too long, you can change the orientation from being horizontal to being angled or vertical. So for example, when they're angled, click apply, notice now that the column titles are at an angle so that it's easily legible. A similar thing is that if you select vertical, they'll be vertically displayed. So this is just making it easier for the reader to read. So I'm going to leave mine as angled. Again, you can change the mark as well as the ticks. In the next tab, gaps, this is where you can specify vertical gaps or horizontal gaps and how wide you want these to be. So there are two reasons why you may want to use a gap. You can put gaps next to and under all the cells just because you think the heat map is more attractive that way. So the gaps essentially serve as borders. So if I select the first option to place the gap between every row and every column, click apply, notice now that the heat map itself has this sort of border effect. I'm going to untick these and click apply. Additionally, you can use gaps to group sets of rows and columns to give more structure to the heat map. So maybe the left half is for one cell line and the right half is for another. And you can put a gap in between these to distinguish between them. So if I show you an example, if I select an additional gap to the right of selected columns and I select C, 
and then click apply. Notice now that you're splitting the heat map in two. So again, the left hand side of the heat map could potentially be one cell line and the right hand side of the heat map could be an additional cell line. So that's just how to use gaps. So I'm going to untick this option here and go to the final tab, which is legend. So it is possible to change the orientation and border thickness of the legend by selecting these options here. So the legend itself is that gradient on the right hand side. So instead of being vertical, let's change the orientation to be horizontal and click apply. So notice now that the legend itself is depicted underneath and it overlaps with our column titles. But I'll move this above the heat map to be at the top in a minute. Also, you can change the scale by entering the value and starting point of the legend. So the intervals here and the starting point here. Again, these are set automatically by Prism. Also, it's possible to change the location of the numbers on the legend. So at the minute, they're set to below and you can also change the tick length. Finally, you can format the text of the actual legend itself and you can even apply a prefix, a suffix or specify what type of data is being presented. So I'm quite happy with this heat map and I'm going to click the OK button to return to the graph. So notice now that the, the legend itself is below and overlapping some of my labels. So I'm going to select the legend and move this up by clicking and dragging. So I'm quite happy with it there. I'm also going to add some text onto the graph above the legend itself. So I'm going to use the text tool. And click on this on the graph. and I'm going to call this normalized gene expression. Put this in bold and then let's click and drag this onto the graph. So it's there. So that's our final heat map. So in this video tutorial, you've learned how to create and interpret a heat map in Prism. And remember, heat maps are useful to use when you want to plot a large amount of data in a matrix. And these are commonly used to visualize gene expression data from sequencing or microarray experiments or proteomic analyses.